uh, we had three breakout discussion questions on the table. One being, what is the thesis of the text from Toni Morrison? Uh, two, what are the comparisons you could draw between Morrison's work and the work of Ngugi, who we discussed on Monday? And then finally, what questions did you have about the reading? Uh, who would like to discuss the thesis of Toni Morrison's preface? Someone besides Eric, because he always starts us off. Or Kevin, because also if it's not Eric, it's Kevin. So let's try to diversify. <laughs> So it's up to y'all. I could uh, call on you or you could volunteer. All right, Abigail, what did you discuss as the thesis for the reading in your breakout group? Um, our breakout room was still a little stuck on our thesis, but we all agreed to um, that the American literature was related to the to the book and how it should be spread and how it should not be kept in and how it should and like the literature should not only be dedicated to the American race and it should be sp like spread more towards other societies. Anyone else want to add to what they discussed as the thesis of the book? Uh, and Eric, if you Eric or Kevin, if you want to chime in, you guys can chime in at this point. All right. What comparisons could be drawn between the arguments made by Ngugi from Monday's discussion? And, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. Oh, no, I was going to answer number two. <laughs> oh, so, two, two, number two. Uh, so the comparisons that I kind of like connected, I talked about this in my group, um, but it's the it's on page 10. It kind of like goes from page 10 to page 11. Uh, well, X to X1. Um, and it's where she says, because I am a black writer struggling with and through a language that can powerfully evoke and enforce hidden sides of racial superiority, skipping on to the next page where it says, my vulnerability would lie in romanticizing blackness rather than demonizing it, vilifying whiteness rather than refining it. What I kind of like connected between the two passages is that they're afraid of rather like embracing themselves. So they would have to hide their embraceness and would have to refi white because you know white is better Ugh. perfect thank you kevin does anybody else want to chime in as far as the comparison they could draw between this reading and what we read and discussed for monday as far as in uh, go ahead eric um yeah i did just want to add on a little bit to what um kevin mentioned um because i was in his group and that was a, gr a good point that he mentioned um and i think also like um i think like tony morrison was like just kind of saying how like those anxieties and those feelings that she was having and she referred to them as the thing and um later on like um she had mentioned how like she was like trying to reconstruct the origin of the like the power powerfully repellent feelings that the thing incites and i think that those like feelings of um like anxiety and depression and things like that stem from um like just the overall black experience and i think as an oppressed group, you do experience a lot of um, like events or situations that can cause you to um, like experience feelings of anxiety or depression just in, in any situation. And so I think that um, what Kevin was mentioning about how um, just the how whiteness was pushed in society and how um, blackness is seen as inferior. And um, I think that can be referred to like as the thing, like as an overall, like the thing of the black experiences can be referred to that if I'm making sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think also this notion of it, not quite naming it, believing it as a thing is kind of emblematic of the experience, right? Because oftentimes you can't quite pinpoint or articulate the racist experience, but you know how it made you feel, right? It's that, it's that thing. So I, I think you're very um, spot on by uh, picking up on that. Um, anyone else want to speak to, okay, go ahead, Ernesto. Um, I just wanted to add on because with what Kevin was talking about his last couple of words, um, when he mentions the idea of white is bad or like at the time, that's what they were trying to show. And they're pushing this idea of like, oh, 
like how white is being pushed everywhere. It kind of made me remember the last class we had when we were talking about how this like coding or this like um I forgot the word, but when we're at a young age that we believe Oh, code switching. There you go, code switching that we have to be a certain way instead of being our normal self. So I just want to make a connection to last class about that because now that now that we've actually talked about it the more and more throughout the day, I kind of realize that's such a casual thing for people. And yeah, I just want to make that connection to the passage. Yeah, no, that's a really good connection, Ernesto. And I think what Morrison is talking about is like a little a literary code switch, right? Like for those who are authors, having to kind of switch their language, their characters to fit this motif that is whiteness, right? So I, I think that's a great um, connection to draw between the two um, discussions. Um, anyone have any questions or anything stood out to you in the reading that was of interest that could be formulated into a question? Again, thinking about the last component of your journal. If no one has any questions, that's cool. Um, but I do want to offer up this uh, bit of information. I hope you have questions in your journals, right? Like what's not acceptable is when he gets to the journal, like, oh, no, professor, I didn't have a question for this reading. Like that is a part of the journal. You have to have a question. Um, the reason being, we're not having an uh, essay due in this course, right? But as a good practice for scholars, for intellectuals, for students, right? When you do write these essays, these essays must work through a question. What is your research question that's driving your essay, right? So at the beginning of the class, I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm finishing up my dissertation, right? Um, my di the question that drives my dissertation, if possible, right? What is the ideal pedagogy for African people globally? That's the question that I'm seeking to answer within the pages of my dissertation. And all of the subsequent pages of my dissertation are going about as best as possible to answer that question. Now, realistically speaking, if you have a really good question, you're not going to find an answer. What you'll find is more questions. And realistically, that's where you want to be at as an, as an intellectual and as a scholar, right? You want to produce questions that produce more questions. I would argue that it's far more interesting to ask good questions, and it's far more productive and generative to ask more good questions than it is to have the answers. Because if you ask really good questions, you'll find out that you really don't have an answer to that question. A really good question is going to produce and beget more questions, right? Um, so I, I do want you all to think about that. And I would argue that the most important part of your journal is the question. It's not anything else, right? The analysis, the contemporary analysis, all those things are cool, but the question is fundamentally important. Um, all right. So we're getting into, this is the text from Tony Morrison. Um, Painting in the dark, playing in the dark, excuse me, uh, whiteness and the literary imagination. So one, we know, and as you all kind of articulated, this, this notion, this thing that is whiteness um, is resurfacing. Um, for Ngugi, it was English, right? The way that whiteness manifested itself was in the form of, of English. Um, but she's looking at more of this identity formation, this um, social construction that we call whiteness. Um, I won't go into what I found, but because she starts off with like a critique about of uh, Marie Cardinal's book, and I'm not gonna really go into that too much. I'm not that interested in that personally. Um, but I think this is an interesting question that she poses, and I'm looking at page V, uh, page eight, um, V I I I, um, towards the middle of the page. Would an Edith Piaf concert or a Dorvac composition have the same effect. Certainly, either could have. What solicited my attention was whether the cultural association of jazz were as important to Cardinal's possession as were its intellectual foundations. I was interested, as I had been for a long time, in the way Black people ignite critical moments of discovery or change or emphasis in literature not written by them. In fact, I had started casually like a game, keeping files of keeping a file of such instances. So in the move in the novel that she's critiquing, right, the pro the protagonist comes into contact with jazz, right? The 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 sounds of Louis Armstrong, and it put her into a 
um, almost a psychotic episode, if you will, for lack of a better term, right? And for Morrison, she was like, well, is it the music jazz itself that's causing that, right? Or would like a uh, Edith, Piaf, Edith Piaf concert, I don't know who that is, um, or a Dorovac, and I know Dorovac is a, is a classical composer, would those type of musical outlets produce the same effect, right? Same affect, right? And um, and she lets you know, right? I'm interested, and I was interested since for in a long time in the way that Black people ignite critical moments of discovery, um, change, or emphasis in literature that's not written by them. So this is a book written by a, a white woman, right? And she's talking about how jazz produced this moment of discovery for her. And for that, and for Morrison, this is what she's kind of interested in. This is where, um, this is her question, right? And this is why I start off our conversation with the importance of question, right? This is how this question is driving the subsequent pages of the work. Um, she says on page 10, many other examples of these narratives, gear shift, metamorphosis, sum um, summonings, rhetor rhetorical gestures of triumph, despair, and closure, dependent on the acceptance of the associative language of dread and love that accompanies blackness were pulling up in my file. Examples I thought of as categories or so of sources of imagery like water, flight, war, birth, religion, so on, that make up the writer's kits. Going down a little bit further. Um, I include the thoughts I had while reading this particular work because they identify the stages of my interest. First, in the pervasive use of Black images and people in expressive proses. Second, in the shorthand, the taking for granted assumptions that lie in their use. And finally, to the subject of this book, the sources of these images and the effect they have on the literary imagination and its product. So, this is kind of interesting because what she's looking at and what she's trying to identify is how these images, and she's focusing on imagery, how it situates, how it kind of guides the imagination of those who seek to produce literature, right? Um, and you could think about uh, books like Uncle Tom's Cabin. You could think of book like books of um like uh what's that one? Of uh, not of mice and men. What's the other one? Um, it's another book that's very popular in um the American literature lexicon. For some reason, the book uh, is the title of the book is just escaping me now. Um, but there's all these books, right? Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, all these great historical texts that make up American literature that shape and predict Blackness in a certain way. Kevin, did you have your hand up? Was it Catcher in the Rye? Yes, that's on. Thank you, bro. Thank you. That's, that's what I was looking for. Catcher in the Rye. And all of those texts that kind of operate in that paradigm, right? Because we have to think about this. Um, early on, literature, books, they serve the space of TV, right? Like, so how we find TV as a primary form of entertainment and maybe it's not even tv no more for y'all but like your phones uh streaming services and things of that nature as those serve as our current form of entertainment back in the day it was books right just as movies begin to shape the way that we understand the world through imagery books serve the same purpose right if we're going to take this example from a literary um, context and move it into the film discussion is anybody familiar with the film birth of the nation birth of a nation has anybody heard of that eric you shake your head can you kind of give us as best as you can your synopsis of the film um i've well actually are there like two versions of it there there, okay i think i saw the the one that was like most recent like okay. the 2016 one um but oh, yeah. that's the one you're talking about now. That's not the one I mean, right? Because oh, that's, sorry. Okay, yeah, then never that's cool, bro. That's the one that's done by Will Parker, right? Um, yeah. Ernesto, go ahead. Isn't there like another one that they talk about? Um, I want to say the Klukas clan. Yes. I'm not too sure, but I just remember seeing it when I was like in middle school, shitting myself because I was like, there's no way that's a real thing. And then yeah. and people just accepted it and they're like, Yeah, this is this is a normal movie. <laughs> Yeah, nah, you're, you're it's, it's crazy. It's a it's a definitely um not normal to say the least, right? So kind of for those who are unfamiliar, I'll, I'll provide some context, right? 
Um, Birth of the Nation is by D.W. Griffin. Um, this is the first feature-length film that was featured in the White House. This is the first feature-length film that went on tour throughout the United States, right? Now, the premise of the film is in what we call Reconstruction America. Now, Reconstruction is a period of America where um, enslavement has just ended. The Emancipation Proclamation is kind of spreading. And, and now those who are formerly enslaved are now able to participate as citizens in this country. Um, uh, formerly enslaved Black men earned the right to vote through the Reconstruction era. And what's happening is because of um, black men having the right to vote, they're effectively being able to vote other black men into office, right? This is the setting that this film comes out of. By and large, during the Reconstruction era, and W.E.B. Du Bois writes about this very proficiently in the text, Black Reconstruction, a lot of the conversation was, well, now that we have these formerly enslaved Africans who are free, what do we do with them, right? And, and some of the conversation was around going, sending them back to Africa. Right. But for those who stayed, the birth of a nation kind of offers up a solution that Ernesto kind of points us to. So what's happening in the film, as I mentioned, right, African men have the right to vote and, and it's only African men, um, not even white women at this point have the right to vote. Um, but like I said, they're able to effectively vote themselves into office and how D.W. De Griffith depicts this is there's black folks in these political offices. Um, their feet are up on the desk. They have no shoes on. They're eating fried chicken. They're eating watermelon, right? These very stereotypical, decrepit depictions of Blackness, right? So this is what's happening within the, the um, political offices. But outside in the city, um, Black men are running rampant, raping white women, right? So much so that in a attempt to free herself from being raped, a white woman throws herself off the cliffs, right? This is the setting that's being drawn out in the film. Um, this black rebelliousness, this black um, rampant black mischief that's being caused is only to be stomped out by the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, right? And this is where you get the, the name of the film, Birth of a Nation, right? Now, um, anybody like Star Wars fans in here? And you like real big Star Wars fans. So the theme song in Star Wars, like this really famous theme song that's in Star Wars, when the good guys rise to take over the um, whoever the, the villain is in the film. I've never seen Star Wars, but I know this interesting tidbit. That theme song is the very same theme song from Birth of a Nation when the Ku Klux Klan rises to take over the city and kick the Black folks out of the area, right? Now, remind you, remember what I said. This is the first film to be shown in the White House. This is the first film to go on tour throughout the United States. Now, Ernesto said he had to watch this in junior high school. I had to watch this in college. Um, when I had to take a film class at Cal State LA during my undergrad, I had to watch it again. It's celebrated as one of the most technologically advanced and revolutionary movie pro uh, productions in film history because the, ca the camera angles, the way that the um, film was shot, right? But the message is what's more important. What the message does is spreads this unnecessary and unrealistic fear of Blackness. Because like, let's think about this, right? If you've been enslaved for over multiple centuries, right? Over hundreds of years, right? And in the plantation system, if you are to even look at a white woman, that could cost you your life. How practical or how realistic is it that the first thing you're gonna do when you get your freedom is go seek to write white women? That's not realistic. Ernesto? I was gonna say, um, for example, Emmett Till, just cause he was supposedly looking at some white women that he was an act of violence. Yep. That's like the best example I can give. It's a perfect example. And if you think about Emmett Till, that is, decades after enslavement, right? So imagine how it was in enslavement or just at the end of enslavement. You're not thinking about raping nobody. You're trying to mind your business. Uh, Fabian? Yeah, I was going to I was gonna also mention uh, Emmett Till. Uh, I, I actually had forgotten the movie until he said it. 
Um, yeah, I had to watch that movie with my mom. I was going to say Emmett Till when he, if I remember, he looked at the white lady behind the counter at the shop. Yep, and that is all that he did to get brutalized, right? Uh, Kevin? And sometimes, like, whenever, like, after, like, slavery was over, um, like, people would be minding their own business, and then you just see somebody get lynched for no reason. They just do it because they were like, oh, you're a different color than me. <laughs> and, and really, Kevin, um, the work of Ida B. Wells in the anti-lynching movement she does a phenomenal job of documenting the majority of the people who were lynched were economically wealthy and they had stores and businesses that rivaled white stores and businesses. So yes, oftentimes it was for nothing, but more than often it was for their economic prowess, their, able, their economic success, right? And, and they're um, posing a threat to white economic success, which caused them to get lynched. But what, you, what I'm trying to get you to understand is the way that film works to produce a unnecessary fear, right, of blackness. Now, again, this is in the early, I want to say even in the 1800s. I could be wrong about the date that this film was produced, but if not the 1800s, the very early 1900s, right? Let's fast forward to like the 1980s through the early 1990s, the films that were popular for me, right? Um, that depicted my experience. Boys in the Hood, Minister Society, Colors, right? Um, Juice, right? So all of these films were very specified because they, for the most part, depicted West Coast lifestyle. Um, Friday, not so much. Um, I, I don't think Friday was as... Um, insidious as the movies I just named because Friday adds a, a human element to Black experiences. It's like, yo, this is what Black folks do chilling on a Friday, right? Um, but where you, if you look at the menace to societies, if you look at the boys in the hood, these are almost more menacing depictions of Blackness, right? Um, so you could, and I, I would say it would be inaccurate, but it would be very easy to classify these films as like gangster films, right? Um, at the same time that these films are released, you have the presence of what we, again, unmistakably or, or wrongly call gangster rap, right? N.W.A., Ice Cube, right? Early Tupac records, right? So what I'm trying to get you to understand is all of these things add to this notion that Blackness is something to be feared. It plays on the imagination. Right. And this is what Morrison is trying to get us to think about. And I'm using um, movie, TV and film because that's more relatable to, to what's going on now. But how she's thinking about this is in terms of literature because she's a writer. Right. Um, I'm looking at page 10 towards the bottom of the page, um, the final paragraph of the sentence that starts with I cannot. Actually, I'm going to move on. I'm going to just read the whole paragraph because I think it's important. Uh, the principal reason these matters loom large for me is that I do not have quite the same access to these traditional, traditionally useful co constructs of Blackness. Neither Blackness nor people of color stimulates me in notions of, access, of excessive, limitless love, anarchy, or routine, or routine dread. I cannot rely on these metaphorical shortcuts because I am a Black writer struggling with and through a language that can powerfully evoke and enforce hidden signs and ra of racial superiority, cultural hegemony, and dismissive othering of people and language which are by no means marginal or already and completely known and knowledgeable in my work. So what she says, I can't really lie on these tropes. And I'm attentive to the fact that within the American language, um, you know, there's racial coding embedded in the language, right? And what does she mean by that? So, for example, eh, it's just a little white lie, right? It's just a little white lie. So white lies aren't as bad as what? Black lies? What's a black lie? What does that mean, right? Racial coding, though. If you look up white in the dictionary, 
How is it defined? Pure, angelic, close to God, right? So this is why a white lie is okay, not as bad. The black cat means bad luck, right? If you look up what black means in the, in the dictionary, it's the direct opposite of what white means. Right. This is what she means by this racially coded language. Even if you are to use the color, not talking about the people black, it produces a negative connotation. You use the color white, it produces a positive connotation. Hence, white to weddings, black to funerals. Right. So racially coded language. So she's saying, I can't, as a Black writer, be lazy enough to think that I could just use this language and not, people won't pick up on the hidden messages and the racially, racial codings of those messages. Another one of those terms, right? Thug. Listen to how and when the term thug is employed or deployed. Who is talked about when they say these people are thugs, right? That's a racially coded word. How people use boy, right? Didn't just didn't Biden just get in the news for his inappropriate use of boy, as he's referring to LL Cool J? Y'all might not know about that, but yeah, it's the thing, right? That's another. It's another uh, racially coded term, right? So this is what she's talking about. As a writer, I must be attentive to these things because these things play on the subconscious of our imagination. It's hard for us, for some reason, to imagine a Black CEO, even though there's a lot of them, right? When you think of a CEO, typically it's going to come into your mind as a white man. That's the way that this imagination is played out. And this is what Mor Morrison is talking about. She says, um, the kind of work I have always wanted to do requires me to learn how to maneuver ways to free up the language from its sometimes sinister, frequently lazy, almost always predictable employment of racially informed and determined chains. All right, so that just lets you know right there what Toni Morrison is up to in all of her books, right? I'm gonna read that one more time. The kind of work I have always wanted to do requires me to learn how to maneuver ways to free up the language from its sometimes sinister, frequently lazy, almost always predictable employment of racially informed and determined change. That's what Toni Morrison's work is about. Using the language to break us away from these racial stereotypes and myths that we have, right? How can you use language to undo that? Um, One of my favorite, I don't, one of my favorite artists, right? And I'm going to use this term artist very broadly um, because he he's a he's a jazz composer, but also he made a, a very interesting and provocative film. Um, he's a poet. So I, I'm just going to use this term artist. His name is Sun Ra, right? Um, he was uh, out of, I want to say, Missouri, um, migrates to Philadelphia. And he, he, you know, he does this really interesting, intricate jazz uh, productions. But he has a whole theology about himself, right? And part of his theology is that he comes from Mars and he is brought to the planet Earth to use his music to bring Black folks to this planet where they can be themselves and be liberated. And he plays this out in a great extent in the movie called Space is the Place. But why I bring Sun Ra up is his use of language and his use and his ability to explode language, right? So one of the things that he would do is he never referred to Black folks as anything but angels. So when he's talking about Black folks, he'll say angels. And the reason why he does this is because, one, it's hard for us in this, because of the use of language, to identify Blackness with something angelic. So he wants to use language to destroy that. When he talks about white folks, right, he refers to them as niggas, right? So you could already imagine how he's reworking that terminology, right? Because automatically through the, uh, our imagination has been limited to only be able to conceptualize this idea, this term, this identity nigga to identify with black folks. So some Ra's like, yo, I'm gonna flip that 
and I'm going to use this term that is meant as a derogatory term to um, to diminish and minimize Black experiences to only refer to white folks, right? So I bring him up as an example of someone who speaks, who seeks to repurpose language and to explode language, right? And to do away with our conventional understandings of language. And I think as an art form, right, hip hop as a whole has done a masterful job of exploding our um, normative understandings of language, right? I, I think even to use, to even think about how um, the term nigga has evolved through the use of hip hop, it's now being looked at as a term of endearment, right? So much so that you have non-Black folks calling themselves and each other that, right? That's an explosion of language. And this is the type of things that Toni Morrison is up to, um, to tie it to a larger African conversation, right? There's this convert, there's this idea of nomo, N-O-M-M-O, -M -M -O, nomo, right? And it's this notion of two-ness. Every time that the deity or the entity nomo is depicted, it's always uh, someone with two heads or two mouths. And nomo symbolizes double speak, right? This is why within Black or African American vernacular or in Ebonics, when we say, yo, that shit was bad, we mean good, right? So double speak, repurposing of language. And this is what Morrison is, is up to in her work and getting us to think about blackness in different terms by using different terminology and different language. Um, I'll put my uh, lecture on pause there. Uh, we'll transition into our fishbowl. Again, you have to do two per semester. Uh, you have one time to pass. You could talk about your journal. You could talk about what you found interesting in the reading. Uh, you could talk about what was discussed in your breakout groups or uh, what you heard in the lecture. All that's on the table. Um, does anybody want to volunteer? I would like to. Okay, Kyle. Uh, was that Kyle you said that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Kyle, anyone else? Any other volunteers? If not, I'll start calling at random. Okay, Augusto. Can we get one more? All right, um, I'll call that random. I would like a, a woman so we can have some gender balance. Um, let me see something real quick. So I think Nina, Nina, you you fishbowl already, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Marlena, you fishbowl yesterday, didn't or Monday, didn't you? Yeah. All right. Um, Amanda, are you prepared to fishbowl today? I finished my fishbowls. No. You, you might. I just, I'm going through all the women on the call to see if you can. I can go. I have a question, anyways. Cool. We'll go with you then. Thank you, Amanda. And we'll know for sure you're done now. Um, so we have Kyle, Augusto, and Amanda. Who would like to start us off? I can go first, I guess. All right. So I have a question. I'm going back on the lecture earlier on like how you were talking about how words like are able to like um, develop new meaning through like people's own interpretation of it, as you said earlier with hip hop. And I was wondering if like, is it better for people like to not care about the meaning of the word so that like it cre could create a new one? Or is it like, we should remember the roots of these words so that we can acknowledge that, okay, maybe we need a different meaning for this word now. Like, you know, what would be the best approach? You know, Kyle, that, that's a very good question. Um, that's a very good question. And, and I think that's a, de a debate that you hear a lot around the use of the N-word, right? Um, and, and what I'll do for sake of time is um, I'll let the other folks finish their fishbowl. And then if we have time, I'll, I'll, I'll address your question, okay? Because that's a, a really important question. Um, Augusto or Amanda, who would like to go next? No, I'll go next. So one of the things that I found most interesting was the movies and how they affect our like perspectives on what we see like in black people and like the base how like it's based on like the perception of them and also how the movies can also make us make them see like 
like it makes them seem like in a better light like it's based on the language and the imagery in the movie absolutely thank you augusta uh amanda yeah so i have a question about a sentence in the reading um the writer says Again, an internal devastation is aligned with a socially governed relationship with race. What does uh, she mean by socially governed? Point me to a... Um, oh, yeah. IX. It's in the middle. Page IX. Or XI or... Oh, no. I'll catch you. In the middle. In uh, Cardinal's narrative, Black or colored people and symbolic figurations of Blackness are markers. Of the no, no. It's more up. Before that. Okay. Again, an internal devastation is aligned with a socially governed relationship with race. Okay. So one, like let's think, let's start here, Amanda. Um, we know that race is a social construct, right? Like it's no real ba scientific basis for race. So one, we know that this is something that's created. Um with that creation being said, right? How what are the ways that the government determines how racial dynamics play out, right? How does the police force serve certain racial communities versus other racial communities, right? How does things like um, social welfare determine the racial dynamics of certain communities versus other communities, right? And I'll, I'll use, for example, social welfare, why this becomes important in language, right? This notion of the welfare queen, who do you think about when you hear the welfare queen? Predominantly, you think we've been socialized to think of Black women, right? But statistically, the most um, benefactors of welfare are white women, right? But no one is going to think of that because of the language that's used and how it's used, how um, media, how all of these government entities, right, uh, produce who is on welfare, who's taking advantage of the system, right? So now through, um, and then if you to use that welfare example also, right? There's a, uh, in the early 60s and 70s, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, there was a clause in the welfare to where if you have a man in the home, you cannot receive social benefits, right? So what does that do? It causes the man to leave the home or the woman to force the man out of the home. So what is the dynamics or the effects of that on the family, right? Now we have single family homes, right? So this is a government policy that has a, an effect on families that has a very specified racial dynamic to it, right? And so this is what she means by those government contrived social and racial dynamics, right? Drug usage, right? So if y'all don't know, the government, the CIA, literally brought crack cocaine or cocaine into the urban areas, right? I say government intervention. One of the reasons why they one of the reasons that they felt that they would be able to stop the Black Panther Party for self-defense was to get that community hooked on cocaine, right? This is how drugs get put into these specific communities. That's a government um intervention that has very racial ramifications for it, right? So does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh -huh. So to kind of circle back to Kyle's question and, and looking at the origins and the context of words, I'm a firm believer in the origins and context of words. This is why um, etymology is important. Right. And that's the science of understanding the origins of words to determine the meaning of the word. With that being said, I personally don't use the N word in my vernacular. Don't not people who do. Right. I don't, I'm not saying I'm better than someone that uses it. I just personally don't use it because I understand the origin of that word. Right. Um, for me, as many lives that were lost with that word being uttered that's not something that I choose to engage, right? Um, furthermore, I feel like there's several other terms that we could use to uplift ourselves opposed to that. Um, to bring it back to our course material, this notion of the metronifer, right? Good speech. I don't believe that referring to someone who I love as a nigga is in alignment with the metronifer, right? That's not good speech. 
even though it may mean in this context, in our 2023 um, moment, something like my brother, my homeboy, my comrade, right? That's what they, how we mean it. But it does not take away the energy that is diffused when that word is used or when it was created. I think um, Nipsey Hussle is a good example of how to think about that, right? He says, and this is, I think he has an interview with um, Ebro, I think this is, and he talks about when you are in a gang and you go to pull a mission, you're not, there's certain people who gets a pass, right? So if you see a dude in a business suit, you're not going to go pull that mission on him, right? If you see someone who looks like they're a scholar, you're not going to go pull that mission on them. What you're going to look for is someone who looks like you, who walks like you, who talks like you, who dresses like you, right? But they're just on the other side of the street, so that makes them your, your enemy, right? Another way to think about that, it's a lot easier to kill a nigga. Go get that nigga. Shoot that nigga. It's easy, right? But go kill that brother. Let's go kill this guy. That don't even, that don't even sound right, right? So these terms, they carry a vibration and they carry an energy. And even though if we try to flip it and make it mean something else, that energy in my estimation is still there. But I get the need to repurpose things. You know, I get the need to try to make, um, do with, with, with what you have, right? But I would argue that for us as a people, as African people, that's not all that we have. Our history is so much grander than that. So that's that's how I don't, and I don't honestly, Kyle, I don't know that if that answers your question directly, but that's how I think about what you're asking, especially when we're putting it within the context of the N word, right? Like I think that kind of shifts the conversation a little bit. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns? I think that's right. I think right, go ahead, Kyle. Say it again. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Like, yeah, we have to understand the origin. It is up to us to like determine. Is this something we want to continue or is this something we would like to stop using and like time will determine the outcome? And, and, you know, I don't even know in this day and age for the vast majority of the people using that word, if they even know or understand the origin of it, you know, um, especially for non-black folks. Right. But I also think um, it's a it's a um, generational thing. Right. Like for some reason. Y'all generation is cool with that shit. Like you are okay with non-black folks employing that word. Like I, I tell you now, I have scars on my knuckles to this day, like still for flying folks' faces for using that word, right? The Mexican homie too. Like you, you the homie, but you don't get that pass, bro. You can roll with us, you can kick it, all that, but that's one you ain't got, right? Um, and I'm gonna chin check you, but we're gonna be cool. But you just know. If you say that word, this is what's gonna happen. Even if you slip, homie, like that, that's just my my knee jerk reaction to go off on your mouth. Like I, that's just the the generation and the era that I come from. Um, it's not the same, right? And and I don't know um, what attributes to that difference, um, but it's it's different, you know. And and I, and I see it all the time, and I have to kind of um, scale back my knee jerk reactions at times, right? Because you you know, go ahead, Ernesto. Um, I just wanted to mention how you were talking about like it's way different from our generation to your generation and I mean there's not like a 50 year period difference it's not like 100 no it's like a good what 20 years I want to say yeah. 20 years rough 20 years I mean you said it yourself during the 90s way different to compare to now and I'm only mentioning this because I've been told by like my own parents like oh because my grandma, she came from, you know, our country, and she's way old school. Like, there's some times where she'll see me do something. She's like, oh, that's not right. You're a guy. You can't be doing this. You can't be doing that. So the way I see it is there's, like, I'm not going to say it's evolved, but it's more like times have changed to the point where we just accepted everything. Like, there's no boundary. There's no limit. You can just do whatever you want. And... There's sometimes where it's useful, for example, like um, 
at least like for me, because I've grown up with four sisters. I've always wanted them to be as strong as, you know, as a guy. Like, I don't want them to think, oh, just because they're a girl and they, can, they can't just walk around. Like, no, I've, trust me, we wrestle, we beat up each other. It's whatever. Like, it's casual. You know, like we're siblings. We're going to mess with each other. But it's way different now. Like, I'm trying to say, think compared to like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, like you can just say whatever you want. And it's, it's happened where like, I've seen family members say something, for example, like I'll say it, like my aunt has caught one of my friends saying like Beaner, cause he's Mexican. He says it all the time. And now that that was like back in high school, it's whatever. He said it one time, I think just out of nowhere. And my aunt caught him and got him in trouble. He's like, oh, I've always said it on Mexican, this, whatever. And I'm like, no, it's it's different. It's something you don't just say. Like, there's a boundary to what you say. Yeah. And, and for me, Ernesto, like, my rule of thumb is this. Like, if, if you have never been called a nigger, right, if you don't know what that feels like, then you don't have the authority or the power to say nigger, right? Like, the only reason you can say nigger is because you understand the pain of being called a nigger, right? And I guarantee you, for those who've been called that, you remember that. I'm 40. I remember the first time I heard that word called towards me, right? I was like six, right? So think about the time span of that. You know what I mean? So there's a certain pain that comes with your ability to use that word if you so choose, in my estimation. Jay, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say real quick that um, what you're saying is true. I feel like when you use the word in such a way that it's not like like what you just said when you use brother, you say it in as in like 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 what you said, like let's go shoot and stuff like that is used as in like a negative type of way to where it's not like to where everyone else can just use it all together. You know what I'm saying? Like it has a history and a background to it. Like me personally, I don't really use it at all. Like my, like when I was a kid, like my dad, he always taught me to, we, we never really use it. We never really say, like, we never really talk about just like, like colored or racial, you know what I'm saying? Cause it brings this like negative impact. Cause based on already what everyone else views, like, you know, being black, like they, they view it in a way that is very sometimes negative or the, a very like drastic impactful way and so when i was a kid i was never taught to just like you know talk about race like that and like uh being black and being everything else so being already taught that word and like knowing that word i never really even used it up until now and so um of course i'm not gonna lie like i've used I, obviously i've used it but not to where it's like you know to where um I use it as in like repetitively, like people nowadays, they'll use it as like, it just flows through the mouth. Like, you know, it's just the, 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 the constant thing that they use. But yeah, I just wanted to say that I agree with you when it comes to using it in a negative way. Yeah. And, and you know, um, I'll end with this and I'll allow others to chime in. Um, there's this Odu Ifa and Ifa is a, a spiritual tradition out of uh, West Africa, uh, predominantly Nigeria, right? Um, there's this concept of Inyam and Inyam, translates to all humans, right? But why this is significant is this inyam is the belief that all humans are chosen. All humans are born with a divinity and they're born with dignity, right? And this stems from the reality that, and think back to our first week of class, um, human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, right? So if we are made in God's image and made in God's likeness, we are made perfect. We've all been chosen to be here. So we're all sacred, we're all divine, and we all deserve dignity, right? So if this is true, how accurate or affirming are terms like nigga or bitch, right? Let's call it what it is. Um, how accurate or affirming is it to this notion or this idea of inyam, of people being divine, of people being dignified, of people being heavenly chosen. I don't think God made no niggas. I, I, I don't believe so. Don't believe God made no bitches. Don't believe so. Society may have, media may have, decrepit culture may have, right? But that's not of God. And for me, 
I seek to be of the things of the divine. I seek to see you all and those who I engage through the lenses of the divine. I seek to hopefully through my dignity, right? Bring out and affirm your dignity and cause you and call for you to act and perform in the highest version of yourself, right? And these terms don't do that. These terms don't allow for you to imagine yourself in your highest potential of yourself. These terms limit our imagination. And what I seek to do is unchain the imagination. So if you can see it, if you can imagine it, then it could be. It's part of manifestation. Um, so for next week, we will jump into Edward Glissant's Poetics of Relations. Um, let me just pull that up for you real quick so that way you'll know what it is and know where to look. Um, so next week, we'll get into week six module. So we will discuss this on Monday and then we'll discuss this on Wednesday. So for next week, we're reading week six, Edward Glissant, Poetics of Relation, part one on Monday, part two on Wednesday. Um, does anyone have any questions, any comments, any concerns, any final thoughts? Oh, everybody's good. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of your week.